Riwuhan. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Give us just a couple moments to onboard everyone. Welcome, welcome. A little, little bit longer. Almost everyone. Welcome to our RIA Now update call. I'm a little more casual than I normally am, and you may hear some strange sounds as we are coming to you from a conference room hidden in the back corner of a hotel in Seattle because we just finished up our Alaskan cruise, and it was wonderful. Um, I think we're all a little uh, still feeling our sea legs a little bit and, and trying to readjust, but it was such a wonderful conference. For those of you that were with us, thank you so much. I know you all had a great time. We had a great time. For those of you who weren't, we'd love to welcome you onto our next one, but we really want to thank you for being here today as always. You have other places you could be. Thank you for spending time with us. Today, Charles, our COO and VP of Legislative Affairs, is going to talk about uh, kind of some updates in the legislative arena. We're super excited because we're going to have Timothy McNichols from LIG Solutions talk about our new uh, benefit, which is a health insurance program. I know we have uh, tried to work with those before and had some challenges and that you had to have uh, not just 1099 employees, but you had to have a true W-2 and be a K-1 um, yourself if you weren't a W-2, but this solution does not require that. So we're very excited to be able to move forward with uh, with that. And, and um, we're going to have him give a quick overview. And then we've got Blast Shelton. You've seen him in the news and we are very proud to be able to have him with us today to talk about some, uh, let's say, innovative solutions to some of the challenges that we're uh, facing today. Just to let you know, we will talk about some uh, topics that may have some financial impact, may have some legislative and legal impact, but we are not attorneys. We are not financial advisors. So if you have questions about how this relates to you and specifically about some of the legal topics we're going to talk about, check the laws in your state, work with your attorney on um, how this can apply to you. Uh, but the, today's information is for informational purposes and educational purposes only. We're here to promote, protect, and educate in the industry. We've done that, uh, we've, it says over 35 years, but we're now approaching well over 40 years with over 120 local groups and 40,000 members. If you want to learn more about us or join with a local group, and part of the reason to do that would be um, our sponsor today, which is Home Depot Pro. Uh, they sponsor our sessions and they are one of our best uh, and benefits. They have special programs for investors and have discounts on paint of about 20% off at the register. They also have rebates and other National RIA exclusive benefits. You can find that program and many others by checking out your local RIA. Um, you can come to our website at nationalria.com. Uh, .org. So that's national .org. Check here. You can see, you can click on I'm an investor. Um, and then right under the wide join is find a local RIA. And when you click on that, it will bring up a map of the U.S. You can find the group that is closest to you. And um, you will have all of the national RIA benefits if you join, as well as those local benefits. So make sure you check them out. But for now, I'm really excited to be able to bring on Tim McNichols to talk about uh, what we have coming up in an upcoming uh, session that we will have uh, together on the 25th. Tim, take it away. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for uh, having me and really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to hear this today as, as well as uh, just joining our program. So I am uh, the Executive Director of Partnerships here at LIG Solutions. Uh, we're a national insurance broker. And as it was pointed out earlier that you've you've tried some of these types of programs in the past and they hadn't worked or, or you looked at trying to get these. And I can say we've done things a little bit differently. So in uh, the presentation that we're going to do on the 25th, I believe it's um, 25th at 2 p.m. if I have that correctly. Nora, correct me if I'm wrong there. That is correct, Tim. Yeah, tw the 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern. 
And um, we'll be going over what is available through this program. Uh, it does cover individuals. It covers families. It does cover and have coverage options for uh, businesses that are looking for coverage for their employees. It is comprehensive and it is based on where a individual lives at. So, you know, the coverage will be uh, unique to your own, uh, you know, unique situation. So as we look at what, um, you know, the options are, you know, we can go through and, and have one of our licensed agents, you know, kind of go through and, and get an understanding of, you know, what your situation is financially, your health situation, lifestyle, um, you know, even things like doctors, hospitals, uh, prescription drugs. And that'll help us fine tune the plans that are that are available. Um, that ranges from you know major medical uh, currently offers uh, short term options, uh, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, um, supplemental options like dental, vision, uh, critical illness, hospitalization, disability, um, and it also has a life insurance option as well. And we work really with just about every carrier as a broker, um, a national broker. That is kind of the, um, you know, the point of, of why we exist. We actually rep rep represent you to the insurance companies, and we're looking for the best option that's going to fit your own unique needs. Um, so that's really kind of the, the, the basics of what we're going to be going over and getting into the details and letting you know how you can access these programs. And uh, with that, is there any questions that you have that you'd like me to uh, dive deeper in today, Rebecca? Tim, I think that's pretty much a good overview. Just wanted to make sure that we encourage everybody to be with us on the 25th as we talk about the specifics of how you can utilize the program and take advantage of this great benefit. Yeah, and I think the the important thing to point out too is that we are getting to uh, what is called open enrollment or annual enrollment, enrollment, depending on your age. If you're Medicare or getting close to Medicare age, something you want to pay attention for that actually starts on October 15th and runs through December 7th for uh, Medicare coverages. The uh, under 65 uh, group, you're going to be looking at a open enrollment period that starts on November 1st and right now runs through December 15th. Uh, we're not sure yet if that's going to get extended like it has in the last couple of years and that changes all the time. But uh, right now we know for sure it will be the typical uh, November 1 through December 15th. And those are for the ACA plans. If you're looking for something for an employer, uh, employee type program, those can be done at any time. Uh, the current short term options can be done at any time. Uh, the supplemental options, uh, again, those can be done at any time of the year. Major medical is when they have uh, the typical open enrollment periods, unless you have what they call a qualifying life event, which then helps you get access at any time of the year, depending on what that QLE was. So with that, we look forward to having everyone join us on the uh, 25th at 2 p.m. And we'll be able to get into the, the nitty gritty and, and kind of the weeds on what's available through this program. Appreciate it, everyone. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. I will take it from here, give a little bit of a legislative update on this. Um, just one of the things I want to come back to, and I, I've kind of been pounding on this a little bit in the writing and different articles, is with the presidential, um, the White House came out with their rent, renter's bill of rights, which was one of those things where they said, okay, we can't do this, but we want everybody else to do this. And basically pushed it out across the states with five different principles involved. One of the key pieces in the administration of addressing this is they are really focused on junk fees right now, and they are pushing that through HUD, through Fannie, Freddie, um, even the, the, the different um, housing authorities, and really pushing on what are considered junk fees. Now, mind you, from the administration's perspective, an application fee is a junk fee. So you got to take this with more than a little bit of grain of salt, but the, the point I really want to make is don't be, you know that guy. Don't be somebody who is charging a fee that's not listed in your lease. That it will be straight to trouble. Make sure you've got everything I's dotted, T's crossed, because municipalities are looking at these now. Um, this is one of those things that, folks, we've got to make sure we are right there where we want to be. Um, if you remember back in April of 2020, right after we got the lockdown in kind of March and there was a gentleman who sent out a letter and said, I don't care about the virus ever and people being laid off or whatever. You need to make sure your rent's paid, blah, blah, blah. And he was going to be a hard line. Well, after getting torn apart, literally internationally, um, he, he kind of backed down and nobody wants to be that guy. So what I'm saying to you is take a look at your leases, take a look at your 
um, amendments, make sure that your fees are in line, make sure that they're consistent, follow up with an attorney if you have any questions on that. Again, state by state is going to differ, and sometimes municipalities inside of states are going to differ, so make sure you're paying attention to that, so I just want to mention that. Um, two other things I'll mention are two lawsuits that we're tracking. One is a rent control lawsuit that is uh, the Housing Coalition has done uh, an amicus brief on it. There's another one on testers and whether or not there's actual harm or damage and what the quality of a tester is. Um, we actually did a separate amicus brief on that one as well. And that's one where we filed at about three o'clock and about seven o'clock that night, the DOJ even filed in and said, yeah, there's a problem with this case. And it was a really good fact pattern. So we're waiting to see where that where that goes. Um, final thing I'm going to mention, and I always see people groan and roll their eyes when I say this, but I, I would say COVID-19, but I don't know if I say COVID, it's like 19 variations of it or whatever. Um, but there is a lot of chatter right now about behind the scenes, new variants kind of sp- stirring up for this fall. Um, We're already seeing over 100 different universities and institutions starting to do masking and clamping down. So I just tell you that as a heads up, pay attention to what's going on around you in your community. There are going to be some communities that are like, it's a flu, I don't care. There's other ones that are going to be, it's death on wings and shut everything down. So pay attention to where you're at. And again, where you invest matters as well. So bear that in mind. And it is coming into the heat of election season with local elections. So I encourage you to make sure you're reaching out to those local candidates. A politician is never more impressionable than when they are running for office. Now is the time to impress upon them who you are as small business owners. And, and this is a time to really reach out, whether it's yard signs uh, at your at your different properties, donations, small donations, being there small amounts of money over a period of time so that they get to know you is more important than writing a big check. That's not going to help. Being there and being present and getting to build that relationship is really what it's about. So we are in the heat of that period right now. So I just encourage you to do that. So that's kind of wrap up our legislative piece. But with that, and there, we're going to come back to kind of legislative issues a little bit here as we as we talk with Flash on this issue. But many of you saw this. Um, I saw this on Jesse Walters and I, I the Waters Report. I, I I envy you, Flash. I haven't made it on that one. That's a great one to be on. He does great work. I love seeing that. And it was this is one where folks as housing providers, we oftentimes get told, you know, we fought criminal damaging issues where somebody pours cement down the toilet, right? Okay, how much damage is that? I've seen situations where the resident got irritated. What do they do? Turn the faucets on upstairs, plug the, plug the drain and leave. Next day or two later, you get there and you're like, you know, 10, 20, 30, $50,000 worth of damage can be done. So that's with a resident. And now, and now when we start talking about, okay, what about somebody who now I got the building vacant? I finally got that troublemaker out. I got it turned around, cleaned up, ready to go. And you come back and somebody's in there. Oh my. Now, now we're talking about squatters. And with that, we have to go to Flash Sheldon on this because Flash, Give us a little bit about what you went through with this. Hi, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here, and and I, I love talking about this um, and uh, want to share. But uh, I mean, the, the very first time uh, was in 2019. Uh, my dad mm-hmm. had passed away, and uh, my mom was in a situation where she couldn't live alone. It was in a small, remote place, and we just wanted her near family. So I moved her in with me and the house was vacant. I hired a realtor to sell, put the house on the market. And, uh, and then I got a report that the back door was broken in and, and there was you know people there. So I called lo- local law enforcement like everyone does. And, um, and they responded and they said, yeah, the back door is broken in, but you said that this house is vacant. And I said, yeah, it's empty, we're selling it. And they said, well, there's a house full of furniture so it appears as though you have a squatter. So this is a civil matter and there's nothing we can do. I said, well, can't you approach them? There was a broken in door and, you know, and I was just completely blown away and I probably said some insults or something. And, uh, and then I just decided, you know, I had heard, I knew nothing about squatters. And I just started looking into, you know, with the association, I'm constantly looking into and breaking down laws and finding loopholes. So I just took what I do naturally and I started looking into squatter laws, squatter rights, and 
you know, reading stories and, and hearing horror stories about what other people are going through and the, the time and money involved. And, and I knew that I had my mom living with me and I love her, but you know, there's only so much I needed her to move in to her own place. So I, um, I knew that we just couldn't go through that. So I, you know, I was kind of looking at like, okay, so a squatter has rights, but when do they actually have rights? Mm -hmm. So they, you know, a lot of times, because most of us initially right away when law enforcement says it's a civil process, the first thing we do is we call our attorney and we file a civil process and we start that, right? So then we go in, we, they get served, we go into court and the judge tells us of their rights. So I figured if I could catch them off guard before any civil process, then basically I would assume those rights if I could switch places with them. And, um, and then at the same time, I knew I was going to be driving 10 to 12 hours. And the last thing I wanted to do is go up there because I had also heard that a lot of squatters have fake leases. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, I don't want to go up there and have them call law enforcement and then present a lease because then I'm like stuck, nothing I can do. So I, I had, I took my mom to a notary and we filled out a lease and signed. And since it was my mom doing it, I made sure it was notarized. And um, I went, you know, armed with a lease just to even the playing ground, just in case. Um, I got there uh, early morning and there were three cars in the driveway and uh, I waited and around 8, 830 in the morning, they start pulling out of the driveway. So I kind of look and I, I, I think I counted, it was something like, you know, six to eight adults. And there was a couple of women and, and mostly men. And uh, I was ready with locks just in case I had an alarm system and I had cameras mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I doing a YouTube show video or a show. I, I video everything anyway, anytime I have an interaction like this and, and I always thought the video is my best protection. And now whenever someone asks me why I'm recording, I say, because it's to protect me and you. Mm -hmm. So um, so they move, they leave out of the driveway. I go in, I start, I, first thing I do is I secure the back door so I can lock them out. I put up cameras inside and out. And as I'm putting up the last camera in on the outside driveway, uh, a car pulls in and it's, a lady and what a uh, young young adult would appear to be her granddaughter um, pulled in behind me. So I'm on a ladder unprepared, but I reach in my pocket, I pull out my iPhone, and I I just kind of aim it down at their waist, you know, and and I start recording, and we have an interaction. Um, I had previously talked to neighbors, um, which is something I typically do, and I had some young guys across the street that I. I told them, if you don't see a driveway full of furniture by 5 p.m., come over, help me get it out. And you can have anything you want. So I had all that set up. I basically told them, I said, look, I said, you know, you broke in the house. I said, oh, and by the way, when I walked into the house to check out the house, one of them, I, I found a prison guard uniform. So I knew who I was dealing with at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they, I told her, I said, look, you know, you you know, you broke in. I said, now it's secure. You're locked out. I'm in possession of the house now. I'm the squatter now. It's my house and everything in the house is mine. And I said, and uh, I said, you, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a day. I'll give you the rest of the day to get your stuff out. Whatever's left is mine. And I said, and if you try to go back in the house, I will prosecute for breaking and entering. I said, cause I'll have it on video and you have no you know, you have no, there's nothing, no record of you being here, you know, and basically I just, um, I played my card and she made a couple calls and, and realized that she really didn't have anything to gain because even if, and one of the things I found out, and I use this today now, and I've done dozens of these, is that the civil process works in my favor as well, mm -hmm. because even if, and I did a follow-up video, what if they didn't leave on outside the box of flash? Even if they called my bluff or whatever, and they decided to call law enforcement, I would be inside, they would be outside. Law enforcement has no jurisdiction either way. I'm not a landlord. I'm not the owner, and that's the difference here. So being another tenant or being another squatter, law enforcement can just say to them, I'm sorry, it's a civil matter. 
Now they have the option to go take me to civil court. But in the meantime, I'm in the house and they're not. So a lot of squatters aren't going to take, I would imagine, the time to to go to court to get back into a house for a temporary solution. So, so Flash, I have to ask, growing up, you always hear the phrase, possession is nine tenths of the law. It, it, and basically what you're telling me is that's kind of true at this point as far as occupancy and who's in there. Right. So yeah. and, and just a qualification, neither of us are attorneys. <laughs> We're not giving you legal advice. Right. You, right. you know, the, the local and state laws in your area, um, that is absolutely critical to do. But mm -hmm. this is one of those things where, you know, you can see even in the comments coming in, Flash is greatly appreciated because there's been so much damage, so much loss um, in a situation like this where they're taking advantage of your mother. You know, sorry for the passing of your father in that situation and a tough time to be going through and then somebody just taking advantage of you. Well, you know, and, and one of the one of the things that most a lot of the comments that I get are about the damages and, oh, they could have destroyed the house. But, you know, I'm reaching out to people now and I'm doing Zoom consults for people, even when I can't go physically do it. Um, and one of the things that I tell people is, you know, I'm prepared and I and I have surprise. Most squatters don't damage the property until they've been ordered to leave. Mm -hmm. So when I catch them off guard, I'm trying to find a situation where I'm going and getting your squatter out before you've even approached them. And once I'm inside, they can't. It's against the law. If they're actually caught in the act of doing damage, there's a you can't destruct property without being arrested. Right. Well, and, and I think it's interesting. You came, you said cameras, locks, you secured it immediately. Those are very important pieces because now you've got you've got control of the property and you've got video evidence right there protecting you. Right. And and that's key. I mean, video, it's, you know, preventing a squatter bottom line is cameras are the one thing. If you have cameras, you'll never have a squatter because, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, that was breaking and entering. There's a law against that. But the difference was I couldn't prove when they went in and I couldn't prove it was them that broke the back door. Right. And if the back door just happened to be open and they happened to be there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, so I want to, I want to tell you something scary. No. So if, if somebody looks at your house and they think that's a nice house and I want to live in that house, they can start sending mail to your house. And the one time they get to your mailbox before you and pull out the mail with their name on it. Now they wait for you to go to the store and they break in your house. All they have to do when you call the police is show the mail in their name in your house. And now they have enough reasonable doubt that it's a civil matter and the police can't do anything. Okay. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I have a situation that I dealt with that a family went on vacation. They went on to Disney cruise. They went to Disney world, husband and wife and two daughters. They came home to a guy sleeping on their couch. They were gone two weeks. He presented a fake lease. Law enforcement informed the homeowners of his rights and made them leave. I guess say, and, and, and we find that a lot with the police throw up their hands up oh, civil but, issue. But they, they, they can't do anything. It's not their fault. I have a I have a video. My most recent video is with them saying, I hope you can change this law because it'll make our job easier. That's yeah, just it's one of those ones where I just sit there and shake my head on it because it just, you know, your property, you've got so much money tied up in this asset and people taking advantage of it, which is where I really appreciate you, you know, turning the tables on them and getting in there um tell well, me a little on, bit on the bigger on the bigger picture i i really you know whatever i need to do eventually you know i'd like to make this a criminal act so that it actually could be you know handled differently well that's and that's where i was going to go with this is tell me a little more about that because you're thinking in terms of again now you got my my legislative policy hat going here okay. and the, the juice is turning so we know it's a long-term process for legislation um yes. It's going to take persistence and money to do that. And it takes multiple organizations typically to raising the awareness on this issue from, from our perspective, from housing providers. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're a founder of the Handyman Association, which we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in just a minute. But we want to kind of look at this issue of what does, okay, squatters rights on one side versus uh, housing property 
private property, which, you know, that's supposed to be on this pedestal in this country that it's protected. Yeah. What have you found on that? I, I think that what I find is that the, the biggest thing is people tend to um, confuse squatter rights with tenant rights because squatters are treated like tenants. And that's what I'm trying to separate out. And, you know, the most of the people that oppose me changing this law are people that are concerned that tenants are going to lose their rights. But I want to make it very clear that a tenant is someone that had a legal right to be there in the first place. A squatter is somebody who didn't. So those laws will be completely separate. What it's going to allow is law enforcement to be able to make an assessment on the scene. How did they enter the house? How did they get there? You know, everything's digital now. It's easy to show an email that, you know, even if they don't have a lease to show, they can show a rent payment on their phone. They can show an email between them and the homeowner. They can show law enforcement enough for law enforcement to determine if they're a tenant or a squatter. If they, you know, if they, if they show a fake lease, it allows a criminal court to go in and process when it's determined that that signature is forged. It deter they're able to then file criminal charges where right now, even if they have a fake lease, because it's civil and it never enters criminal, a squatter has no, they have no reason not to be a squatter if you think about it, because there's no jail time, there's no fine, there's no restitution. Even when they damage your house, no one ever gets paid back because there's not a criminal act. So I want to change that so homeowners can get reimbursed for damages. They can get reimbursed with fines and penalties. And the squatter has the threat of going to jail. So that's going to detour some squatters. Is it going to eliminate all squatters? No. But the, the squatter that just figures, hey, I can take advantage of the system and I can live for free for six months, eight months, a year, and I can save that money, it might detour some of those. It's interesting you mentioned, because one of the key pieces to that is, again, outside of a fraudulent lease, is do they have a lease from the actual property owner to them? And that legal name, whether it's an LLC or whatever, to that actual resident, and do those match up? And you can pull up property records I mean, you can do it on your phone. It's it's a pretty simple pull up. And, right. you know, even the police can do that right there and simple um, that. And then we can find out, hmm, are they on the right track or not? And we and, do. And I have and I have law enforcement support. They they're shaking my hands. I go to every every time I do a squatter um, intervention is what I call it when I first approach them. Um, you know, I go to the department. I talk to them, tell them what I'm going to do, where I'm going to be. And they, they didn't sign up for their job to have to, to walk with their tail between the legs and be like, I can't do anything. I'm sorry, man. I mean, they, they want to be able to grab these guys and throw them out. Right. So, so I do have that support. And, um, you know, it's, it's a big deal. This is a worldwide problem. This is a, a nation problem. It was like a billion, you know, United Nations estimated over a billion worldwide. So mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a problem that's been going on way too long and needs to change. Well, and with a affordability and housing as a supposed crisis across the country, and there are pockets where it is a crisis versus other areas where people just, I don't want to work. I just want stuff handed to me free. Hey. Yeah. And, and well, they, they go around and looking for it. And there's literally websites out there that tell you things to look for. Um, well, one of the things I'd like to point out also is that, you know, some people want to, they, they, they turn it into a homeless thing. And so I, I was homeless when I was young, as a child, I was homeless and, and, you know, everyone will say, oh, well, not everyone can afford a house. I'm 56 years. I've never owned a home, but I work hard for everything I have. And in my experience, we're not talking about homeless people. Homeless people have more pride than squatters. Homeless people will live on a cardboard box before they will try to take from you. So we're dealing with people that find loopholes in a law, mm -hmm. figure out a system, figure out how they can do it. I've run, I ran across a squatter recently. She had $140,000 in her bank account. And she was taking advantage of an elderly woman and living for free. I have a guy in Hollywood right now. This guy made $70 million a year. He, 
was a restaurant tour. I just posted a video about him. He, um, he basically said, you know, he's this widow. She her, lost her husband. She decided to rent a room. He figured out a way to get in there and refuse paying rent. And he's been living for free and I'm trying to get him out. Yeah. And that's, and I think the, the word we're looking for isn't just squatter, it's scammer. And yeah, absolutely. We, we have seen no shortage of that. We talk about, um, we recently did an article on paychecks and payroll. People will bring in fake payroll when they come in to get, you know, they don't have a job, but they can print off these novelty websites, this fake payroll, which Flash, I have to tell you, it's amazing when they come in and they go, what do you mean the math's not right? right. Yeah, yeah, you know, you made less exactly. in your second week total. It's like, it's amazing how bad some of the scammers are, but the websites are out there to help them do that. And it makes yeah. it a well, and, temptation for more people. And on the legal side of it, I, I need to express that this cannot be the homeowner. It cannot mm -hmm. be a landlord. And what makes it, one of the things that makes it legal for me to do that is either I'm a tenant or I'm a squatter myself. But I also can't accept money directly from a homeowner because they, if they're paying me to do this, then the homeowner's involved and it's just, it goes against self-help laws. So what I do is I take in donations and I use donations to support my crew so that there's no trail from a homeowner, from a landlord hiring me to do a service for them. Then I go in and I help these people and the, the donations go to help people like that a lot of elderly, a lot of elderly mm -hmm. I, I end up helping, but donations going to help these people. And it also on the bigger, on the bigger thing, like you brought up earlier, it's going to take a lot of money to change law. So, right. so that's why I opened up the GoFundMe was for the purpose of the big purpose, because I can't physically help everyone unless we can get laws to change. Well, love to see any, uh, if you've got any sample language or whatever, we'd happy to, you know, take a look at that with some of our uh, attorneys and even work with our, our DC lobbyists to see if we can make some recommendations across the country, some generic language even that could be utilized. Um, sure. But uh, along those lines, so and I and I do have I do have a petition and the GoFundMe fund me on my links on my Instagram at Flash Shelton. Okay, Brad, yeah. if you can maybe pop that up there when you get a moment, um, and then or Flash, if you got a chance to throw that up there, that'd be great. So we can check that out. People will love to see some of those videos. Um, oh, that, think, that that's actually on YouTube. The videos are on Outside the Box with Flash. All right. We'll get that going. And then, so I, I want to go back to something. You mentioned a little bit, and again, this is not a, a recommendation. This is not legal advice. We are not attorneys giving legal advice. But if in the event that you were dealing with um, scamming squatters, and I'll put it that way, this is a situation where they're taking advantage of you in one form or another. Flash, you mentioned about going into, th there's an intervention process there. Is this, are you the only one out there doing this or are there more people? Is this becoming a association in and of itself as well? Well, I, I do have a crew depending on what I'm dealing with. So I, I, I do a Zoom call with the homeowner or I'll do an interview in person first, depending on where they're located. Um, and so I get the details. If they know names, then I do a background. I find out who I'm dealing with. And then it determines how big my crew needs to be. And, um, you know, the most recent one, this guy just made me sick. And on Labor Day, I, I couldn't wait for my crew. I couldn't wait for donations. I just had to go do it on my own. And everyone calls me crazy for doing that. But, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just had to do it. So, so in that situation, I literally had a GoPro on my chest and I was holding my iPhone in my hand because I didn't have anyone else to hold cameras. And, um, and I just did it by myself. But, but for safety reasons, um, mm -hmm. it's better for me to have a crew. So at a minimum, I've got you know, a big muscle behind me named Dylan who, who uh, you know, goes with me. And, uh, and then I usually have a full camera crew. And, and you know, we're, so I've gone in at, with as much as six guys behind me. Right. It, it, it does help. There's a reason that the military, the police, whoever going into force. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that helps probably more than the muscle, honestly, a lot of people don't want to be seen on camera. That's... They don't want their lives exposed. And one of the things with my following and with the news coverage, and now every time I do anything, I get a reporter reach out to me. 
Um, <laughs> one of the things that I can do now is say, look, I'm going to run the story. So whether I show your face or your name is totally up to your reaction. That's, that's a great point. And you've got to reach a certain level of notoriety right. <laughs> right. To, to be able to do that where they go. Oh, um, yeah. I, I'm a fan of the guy who puts the, um, uh, what are they trapped gift boxes out on people's porches and to stop the porch thieves and they'll take oh, really? it and sprays out glitter and smoke and stink. Oh, wow. And I haven't seen that. Huh. Those are, those are some of my favorites. Having had something stolen off a porch, it like, I'm like, <laughs> you go, man. So right, you know, right. in that same vein flash, it's like, you know, we appreciate what you're doing. Um, and we want to share this around because this is something, if it can be replicated in other areas and other people can do it and, you know, following Flash's foot footwork here, we could, we're happy to have that. Um, I do want to touch on another association. You're you're a founder of the Handyman Association. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's a United Handyman Association. Uh, it started in 2009. Um, I actually, starting in 2002, I, I was lobbying California, trying to change contractors' laws to be more inclusive to handyman work. And, um, you know, a lot of homeowners don't realize that in most places, it's illegal for a contractor to do handyman work. So a homeowner or property manager, you need somebody to come out and do one repair. And a general contractor is prohibited to do jobs that are less than two trades. So, you know, they're subject to fines and things like that. And also their insurance doesn't cover them when they write, work outside of their license. So doors slammed in my face and basically contractors board saying, there's nothing we can do. We can't change our whole structure. I, I started looking into, well, is there, you know, every, every trade has like, they must have an association or, or some sort of union to represent them. And, uh, and there wasn't anything. So I founded, you know, I founded the United Handyman Association back then. And I started creating all the program and the, everything and offering free memberships back then. And, um, and then now, you know, we're nationwide and, and uh, offering services like insurance for them. And we actually, I heard you guys talking about uh, medical insurance and we have a new medical plan coming out. So these guys that, uh, you know, own their own businesses can, can get medical insurance. And, um, you know, we, we do background screening. Um, we uh, check references um, and we give, you know, not only a, a, a platform for people to reach out and find a handyman, but also if they already have a handyman, they can anonymously have them screen them. They just, they just sign up and give us their information and we can screen them. Um, we check their insurance because a lot of guys will get insurance. They'll pay the first, the first payment. They'll get their COI. They show the homeowner they're good to go, but then they don't make the second payment. They don't make the third payment and they show a COI all year long. So we actually verify that members of ours put us on as uh, additionally insured. We get notified when, you know, if their insurance gets, gets canceled, um, you know, so we can keep um, homeowners apprised when they become my home members with us. So then that kind of is a, is a benefit for them. Um, and, and then we, we offer to back, to stand behind our certification. Um, if, a, if a certified business takes your money and doesn't do the job, then we have a fund up to $5,000 to pay you back for your loss. So I wanted it to be a win-win. We give them jobs by referrals. We give them a, 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 pay, a, a, a web page, you know, so that customers can find them. And it's a win-win for, I think, the homeowners and the handyman. Oh, that is great. I, I can tell you, uh, everyone in our line of business has at least one or two handyman on speed dial because we need them. Um, yeah. A lot of our folks don't have employees and we might use 1099, but contractors and handyman, they are worth their weight in gold. And so we appreciate you, you providing that for us. And we look forward to kind of working a little more closely with you on that and maybe sharing out some information. I, I know from a great. small business owner perspective, you're, you're right, right on track with, you know, the, the, the insurance, a little bit of knowledge tracking on that. Trust me, we have renters who, oh yeah, I've got renters insurance. Here's the first payment. And then right, you know, right, you exactly. again. Yeah. I, I started my first handyman business. I was 16 years old. I was in high school and I started handling properties around the neighborhood and I turned it into a business. And I, and, you know, back then in the eighties, all the talk was all about 
Social Security is not going to be here when you're older, all of this stuff. And I came from, you know, very, um, you know, we were we were not, uh, you know, we, we just got by as a family. So um, so I never thought that I was going to be I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be rich. I was going to, you know, whatever. But I just had this thought that at 16 years old, that if I built a business to continue, it could that could continue without me, that I would always have an income. So, you know, I. I've opened several businesses since then, and and now my my passion seems to be squatters. That's awesome. Well, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you move beyond the squatters to get this this law working in, in 50 different states, which will pull your hair out what's left of it. Trust me, there's not much left on mine from uh, dealing with that specifically. So, well, <laughs> we we look forward to working with you on that. Let me put it that way. Um, Thank you. And I've, got a, and I've got a, a, a squatter show going to be coming out hopefully soon. I, I, I can't, I'm not at liberty to mention anything more or a network, <laughs> but, uh, but we are in those stages. We just shot a, uh, uh, um, like a pilot thing the last few days. And, and uh, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to do this on, you know, uh, for more people. That is awesome. And please share that with us. We'll be happy to share that out as well. And, and, you got 40,000 members here at National RIA that are rooting for you. So we appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. I don't know if there's well, any other I, questions. You know, I I appreciate any support I can get. Absolutely. Well, you, you, you're doing God's work on some of that. So we appreciate it. So, but uh, keep us informed on that. And again, from a legislative perspective, happy to work with you. We can take some of that offline as well and catch up with you. But uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you have any other questions or Flash, did you have any other kind of final comments or thoughts for us? Uh, you know, just um, I would just say, you know, safety is number one, mm -hmm. you know, know your limitations. If you're going to do any of this on your own, if you're going to have, oh, well, I can get my son to do it or something like that. You know, just just be careful. And, um, you know, just like he said before, you know, I check every law everywhere. Um, I am trained both physically, mentally for this. I am trained and certified in de-escalation. And I also carry. So I, I, you know, I go into this fully prepared and I expect the absolute worst in every situation. So I would just say safety is number one and just be careful and absolutely check the laws out in every detail, because the last thing you want to do is be arrested for trying to do something good. Absolutely. I appreciate that and appreciate that little legal disclaimer as well. Just Make sure you know what you're doing and be careful and be safe out there. And with that, Rebecca, we'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for being with us today. Um, I saw a couple of you said that this is one of your favorite sessions. So thanks, Flash, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, make sure that you put the 25th on your calendar and join us if you have any questions or interest in the insurance program. We're super excited to roll that out. I know many of you are having challenges with that, and we want to make sure that you are informed prior to uh, open enrollment so that you can make some really good decisions. Um, lots of education coming up that will be rolling out after the cruise. So at the first, uh, at least by the first of the year, you'll be seeing that on the um, education, the National RIA University site. And thank you to everybody that's been with us today. Have a terrific afternoon. See you next time.